Welcome to the Fix Medical Group Podcast. I am today's host, Dr. Sam Wag, and I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Patrick Cucarola. Today, we're going to be talking about nutrition, and it's trying to make it easy for everybody so you can start to get a handle on how do we change it, what is it, and what do we need to know about it. So, Pat, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me again. Of course. My first question, and let's just kind of get started with this, is what is nutrition? What's that definition that should make it easier for everybody? From Webster's Dictionary, the all seeing above. Um, essentially, it nutrition's, I guess, a reason to be, I guess, what we have with nutrition is it sustains life, mm-hmm. provides energy, and promotes growth and healing. That's its job. We kind of treat it like this, oh, let's just feed ourselves to kind of get through our day. But when you really think about it, just that definition Look at your food and see, does it actually do any of those things? I always joke, yeah, donut. That's technically a food, but it's not nutritious. Provides energy. Yeah, it's a sugar high. Then you crash. Does it promote growth? Yeah, straight to your hips and butt. (laughs) That's not nutritious. And so, but when people are kind of thinking about their foods, they're just kind of shoving it down to get and move on to the next day. But when you really take a step back and look at what is its purpose, we need to think about those big definitions. Yeah, and it's all about that, taking the, the step back. We live in a very instant gratification culture, and we want to see results really instant. I think a lot of the clients that we talk to, when it, we start to talk about nutrition and bring up that um, topic, it's like, how's your diet? That's well, not too bad. And they'll admit maybe a few things that they do that they know aren't good, right? And realistically, if we could zoom out or maybe have the – I don't know how to see this, but (laughs) it's like we can't comprehend that food that we're um, chewing and breaking down going into these such small little pieces. And that's exactly what our body is using to rebuild itself. So if you think of the inside of your body, like a job site, like a construction site, and ultimately what you put in, that's what you're delivering to all of your workers or to that site. So you're actually delivering the workers themselves plus the materials. So what are you expecting based off what we're eating? So that was a good example with a donut. A little bit of energy, but it doesn't help you for growth and repair. No, nothing at all. Like when you look at other, or even just another analogy, you're the analogy king, <laughs> but like gasoline. Do you want to put in crappy gasoline in your car and expect it to perform well if it has a whole bunch of other junk in it? No, we want that pure gasoline, right? right? Especially right now with how pricey gas is. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We want to make get that bang for our buck. So I would say uh, on my analogy, when... What we do really determines how those workers function and then what we eat. So by what we do, I mean how we sleep, how we exercise and use our body, but what we put in ultimately becomes those building blocks. So um, to kind of get into this a little more, we usually break nutrition down into two main categories. That's our micronutrients and our macronutrients. Can you describe that a little bit, Pat? Yeah, macro means big, right? So we're going <laughs> to yep. think about your proteins, your carbs, and your fats. And then your micro, small. So those are your smaller nutrients, so your minerals and vitamins and those types of things. Yeah, and just like um, we'll get into this more, but all of those are important. Uh, we're going to start with those macronutrients. Mo- people are most familiar with these. Like Pat said, your protein, carbohydrates, and fat. And maybe you've heard one of these is bad. Um, I think People typically think carbs are like evil, fat is bad, and then protein is okay. And at the end of the day, we really need all three of these in the right combination. But what we're going to talk today about making sure we actually utilize them at the right time for ourselves, because it's not always going to be the same every single day. Yeah, and life's about balance, right? And that's what it comes down to these macro and um, micronutrients. You have any of those off balance, you're not at your peak performance and your body is not functioning right. So everything that we eat is broken down into those micros and macros. Um, uh, Think of that being the parts that are being delivered. (laughs) My brain fart there. Um, Pie chart. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, What's being delivered. So are those proteins are broken down, carbohydrates, fats. But when we're trying to repair, so say someone has an injury, yeah, that's a time where a little more protein in the diet makes sense because your body is sourcing and looking for materials to rebuild an area. 100%. Um, are there any, well, I'll hold that question. Uh, <laughs> so maybe you've heard of someone, uh, like I just said, there's typically, I think carbs are thought of as being kind of bad or something really to avoid, especially if we're trying to lose weight. So, 
Um, maybe you've heard of someone carb loading and I'm going to let Pat kind of take us through this example of an athlete and loading ourselves for performance. Yeah. Carbs are the easiest to digest for that energy. So you want to use it like right now. And so carb loading is essentially loading up on a bunch of carbs because you're about to perform, you know, that athletic movement or you're doing some very high energy things. A lot of us though, usually carb load when we're sedentary on a couch, you're feeling bad, you're feeling blue, sick, all those things. And you're not really needing that carb loading, but we are doing our body. So you're just stacking yourself, even just excess calories. If we just want to get down as simple as that, but also the carbs and your body doesn't need that to produce the energy because you're just watching Netflix, right? (laughs) Yeah. So what Pat said in the very beginning, let's, um, let's actually separate this for people. So carbohydrates are our fastest burning fuel source. So when we're looking for quick energy and like Pat said with the donut, that is a quick fuel. Your body breaks it down really fast. It's available for energy really fast, but you're going to burn through it really fast. So in general, carbohydrates are that faster burning fuel source. We should be looking to use those when we're doing activities like running, um, biking, something that's really keeping the heart rate up. And imagine your body is taking that food and converting it from a food into an energy. So like I said, that carbohydrate breaks down faster, becomes energy faster, use it for the faster motions. What about fats, Pat? Fats are the slower energy usage. Um, so your avocados and those types of things. So you're not really going to want that if you're going out for a, you know, quick sprint or a run. Mm-hmm. Like if anyone's ever seen those like energy chews, I laughed at one of my patients. He said, he's like, oh yeah, I have those next to my desk so I can get a little boost of energy. And he's just sitting there on his computer. He's not running the <laughs> marathon. You know, marathon runners will use it while they're running. It's easy yeah. to digest. So they have that quick burst energy, but they're not bringing these good, healthy fats with them. You know, they're not eating avocado on that 24 mile race. <laughs> right. Of course, they're seeking that fast, fast energy. Mm-hmm. So as we keep breaking these down um, with fat, it is a slower burning fuel and it takes longer to convert. However, fat is much more like energy dense. So when our body breaks these things down, they it, try to make this not sciencey. <laughs> when our body breaks these three micronutrients down, though, protein and carbs, they burn the same. It gives us four kilocals of energy. So when they break that down and you burn it, that's essentially how much it could raise like the heat, so mm-hmm. to speak. Fat is a little bit more than double. It's nine kilocals of energy. So yeah, it takes a lot longer to break it down, but when we're using fat as an energy source, so if you've ever fasted before or you've um, maybe in like a keto type of diet or done something to get your body into what we call ketosis, meaning that your body's predominantly burning fat for fuel, you'll notice that your mental clarity, your focus, you're just hyper sharp because your brain's preferred fuel source is fat. So when we can supply it with that and get it to burn that, that's awesome. So to kind of um, even bring it full circle from what we've already talked about, what Pat said with a patient of, um, you know, the mindset, uh, I'm going to have this energy chew because it says right on energy, you can't fault them there. So, but that's like, it's a very intentional type of energy that, hey, when you're running, this is something that literally can toss it in your mouth, not a lot of mechanical breakdown and boom, your body has some fuel, Mm -hmm. just like they would do like um, the gels. uh, That's really common in mountain bikers or uh, street bike people that are consistently like you have to fuel during the event. It's so long, but those fat sources aren't really going to work then. And they're not necessarily using fat stores for what they're doing. And for the most part, we want to use fat. You know, we all want to lose a little weight or just slim down. So you want to be burning the fat from the food for your energy, as well as from your body. And so, but so many of us are always in the mood of now, 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 and we're not thinking I want, fat to be burning or we want to be using fat and that's our body's actual best way to utilize uh, food or the nutrition for our energy right and um so with that example of the person sitting in the cubicle or at a desk and you're working on your computer we should aim to have like a fat full breakfast if that's going to be your first meal leading into that day and um, we can continue to extend that fat burning you know the name is in the it's in the name breakfast is break fast after we sleep when you've been asleep for about eight hours your body utilizes all the glucose that you have so you've really have got rid of all the carb that's circulating and now your body's utilizing fat but the first thing so when you wake up in the morning usually you are actually burning fat as a source that's why intermittent fasting is so popular there are ways to extend how long we keep our body burning fat 
And Pat and I coach people on different techniques to do this all the time, whether it's adding, you know, having some type of fat source in the morning to extend this or just being really diligent on what we choose for foods so that we can extend the amount of time our body is burning fat. Why wouldn't we want to do that? Also, when we wake up, we're in a pretty good hormonal space and we tend to break that kind of gets broken as soon as we start with uh, carbohydrates, which is your kind of standard morning food, right? You're exactly. having your cereals, your breads, your pastries, even your sugar in your coffee, all that's breaking a fast, but not in a good break. Exactly. We're breaking it down and then we're fueling ourselves ultimately with a lot of fast fuel. Um, and most people like what Pat just said, if you're imagining, you know, maybe getting a couple of kids ready in the morning, kind of hustle, hustling through your household and just grabbing something quick. Most of those people are going to a job or going to be seated and semi sedentary. Um, we talk about this with patients all the time. Having a very mentally busy and draining day is a lot different than having a physically draining day where you've actually utilized and burned through a lot of fuel sources. That's a lot different. So we want to make sure we're fueling for what we're actually doing. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the burning fat. And the easy example we use in the office is imagine uh, like when you have a job, you know how much money is coming in and you're able to budget for all the things that happen in your life. There are certain things like kind of your personal overhead that whether you have a job or not, your rent, your electricity, some of these things that we have to have, your life insurance, um, food. you're going to, yeah, your food, you're going to continue to pay for all of these things, regardless of having that income coming in. So you would need to budget that money and you would probably go into like a little bit more of a scarcity, not spending and putting money out in the same exact sense. If you think of that money coming in as fat, your body has certain processes that have to happen no matter what whether you're eating a lot of fat or not. So when you're only getting a small amount of fat, your body has to hang on to what it has to make sure it could carry out those processes. So we hear this all the time where someone says, I can't lose those last couple five pounds, or I hit a plateau. I can't get over this area. Well, what a lot of people do is they get close to that plateau and they starve themselves of fat. Well, you're not convincing your body that it could burn and utilize what it has because it's being replenished. So we need to convince our body by continuing to give it that fuel source so it'll burn it and feel comfortable knowing more is going to come 100 percent. it's like your savings account right mm -hmm. you want it in your financial life but you don't want to have a huge savings account when it comes to your uh it's your nutrition or those excess calories yeah because ultimately fat is just stored fuel and um fat has a really bad stigma in our in our country in the world you know obesity or weight gain um but ultimately, that's a symptom. It's just a very visual symptom that our body is not breaking down the nutrition and utilizing it the way that we should. It'd be no different than someone coming in and having a rash or like a lot of redness. And then we would start to think like, okay, what are some things affecting your skin? You know, did you eat something different recently? Do you change your detergent? Is it a soap? Did you use a skin product? We would use that symptom to start to work into what we can do to help. And unfortunately, weight gain, uh, it's very like taboo to approach that way. And it shouldn't be that way. So um, hopefully this is a good start of kind of understanding from a nutritional standpoint. And maybe some people are, that's kind of hitting home for them of like, okay, I'm not really fueling for exactly what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's not all about, I guess when people start to break down these macros, a lot of people start to think, Oh, I need to get these certain amount of grams and everything that is important. But overall, just having a good understanding of how much you're putting in your body, just a general awareness. So you don't have to be obsessive about it. So you are hitting all those goals when it comes to your proteins, your carbs and your fats. And so like Sam was saying was understanding the good fats that you're putting in and not, you know, just eliminating them or like, Oh, I think I got it, but just being aware. So you are fueling yourself in the right way. Yeah. So in summary so far, making sure we have a good balance of protein, carbs, and fat. And it's not as simple as just a third, a third, a third. What we mean by balance is you not being afraid of any of them, but utilizing them when we need it. So what that could look like is if I'm going to have a more sedentary day, I'm going to go higher on those fats. I'm going to keep my carbs pretty low. I'm definitely avoiding those processed foods and sugars that need that high energy to burn off. 
I would keep it down to like my complex carbs, but a little higher, um, you know, middle of the road on my protein and higher on the fat. What does it mean when I say that? That could be a breakfast that's like avocado, bacon, a little bit of eggs, um, and maybe some spinach. So some type of greens in there. That's a good balance. That's good fat. That's going to be a calorically dense little breakfast. That's going to give me the energy I need, need mentally. So if I'm seated, more sedentary, I can power through that day. Um, you know, my lunch is going to be something similar. Maybe that's a Cobb salad. That's an easy way. That's like higher on the fat side, but it's still healthy in the sense of I can, you know, obviously when everything's quality sourced, really comfortable with that. And then the same thing at a dinner. If we were to flip that and say, I'm Patrick and today uh, we're going to be working an event and maybe we're going to be on our feet all day. And then um, we're going to go hike after. So now I'm Patrick and me. It's the two of us. <laughs> so that breakfast is going to be, could have some carbs. So we could start to put in maybe some healthy carbs there. Um, but I would still go for some of those fats. Mm-hmm. But then knowing at the lunchtime, we're probably going to recarb up a little bit. and becomes more of a 50-50 carb fat type of day as opposed to going higher on the fat side. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's a little bit of strategy behind it. Like on certain days that I do have the time to work out in the morning, I might have a little bit more carbs than that, but if I'm not going to get to the gym or do something, you know, active, you know, on the weekends until later in the day, I'm not going to start my morning off with that because I don't need it. It's just fueling for the right purpose. Right. And I I like what you said, or bringing up the workout point, it's so important. We see this really often where people forget that a workout or exercise, it's simply just a stimulus. It's stimulating your body to a So working out like weightlifting, we're stimulating our body to create an overcorrection and build us back even stronger because we struggled to do those movements and we're stimulating our body to make that change. But often when people aren't seeing changes, they just go back to more and more and more stimulus. Well, you are never going to see that change unless we provide. That's like, you know, our internal job site. You're just sending out that project manager and you're like, I really need you to complain to them. It is not getting done. And like the workers are standing there like, do you see the parts that you're giving me? And you want that house, but you're giving me these pieces. It just can't be done. Um, But I hope that helps some people understand, like you can't really work your way out of where we are from a body composition standpoint without factoring in the nutrition. 100%. I will love to use bodybuilders as examples of physique competitors. They take it to an extreme, but you can use how they go about their programming in our daily lives. So they're trying to build a ton of muscle and they're not so worried about their little bit of fat gain because they're trying to bulk up. So they are carb loading a little bit more. They're lifting heavier. But when it comes to almost showtime, that's where they get very specific on decreasing the carbs and certain times playing around to kind of get to a shred. So if you take what they do to a more general healthy aspect, you can kind of apply that to your life and your goals and what you want to do. Right. And. It is to an extreme when they do it, but it's no different when we're trying to build a little bit of muscle um, in our body. The example I use for this one, imagine being home at your house. And if you want to build an addition at your home, you need to kind of convince your body we have enough supplies and finance to do that. Um, That would be the first limiting factor that you would have as a person is like, oh, I can't afford where we can't, we don't have the supplies and the materials. So if you've tell showing your body and like Pat saying with that physique competition, they're eating additional carbs. So then when they go in and they stimulate themselves very aggressively with a workout, their body is, has the extra materials lying around to put on extra muscle. But muscles are very metabolically expensive. They're really demanding on our body. And your body's not going to add more muscles unless you have the resources to fuel that and fund it. Yeah. One of our patients, he didn't really want to listen to me, um, (laughs) but he was on this, uh, I guess, physical body uh, composition uh, journey. And he started working out really hard, but then he got into some heavy dieting and very, very low fats and very, very low carbs. And he saw the weight change on the scale, but when he looked in the mirror, he wasn't happy. He looked scrawny, like he lost muscle and fat and pretty much everything. And it didn't hit his goals because he didn't have those, what are you saying, the finances and the supplies that applied. So on the scale, yeah, he was happy that the number was going down, but the way he looked and the way he felt was not what he dreamt of. So we kind of had to coach him in a different way and get very, a little bit more specific, like, hey, let's boost this up because this is your goal. This is what you're trying to do. And it's supplying the body with what it needs to build to where it wants to be. 
it seems really counterintuitive if we took that example, um, say I wanted to add 10 pounds of muscle to my body and I was trying to do it in a, the fastest way I could. I'm probably going to increase my protein up to, I would do five grams over what I can, what I weigh currently. And I would consistently do that. I would monitor the weight as we keep going up. Then when I got to that target weight, so I fueled myself with enough protein, I want to keep my protein now at that level without adding the additional five, but then we're going to switch. So what Pat's saying, like we have to coach him towards some of those goals. He would be making this tweak with me of like, all right, now we're going to keep your protein here, but let's increase this fat. And I don't want you to all of a sudden fat starve yourself. We need to give your body a lot of fat, get you using more of that as a resource. So now I can have the added bonus of the muscle, but any little extra fat that I brought on, which it's normal to add a little bit as we do it, we can rid- get rid of that because we're using that as a fuel source. So it's like, all right, we added a little stored fuel, but I'm going to burn that as we do it. Um, so let's kind of bring this um, kind of all together, Pat. Um, ultimately, well, I do want to touch on one thing that we didn't, which is the micronutrients. micronutrients. <laughs> this one's pretty easy. Um, these are our vitamins and minerals. Where do you see the importance with these, Pat, or how do you talk to patients about them? I hate that they're called micro because they are extremely <laughs> important. They're macro important, just not at the, um, I guess, same levels or the same amounts as the, um, the ma- I guess, our actual macros. But they help sustain life. They provide energy. They help us heal. They boost your immune function. And getting out those are, is important for overall health. Now, a lot of ways that people do this is through supplements. I love the word supplement because that's exactly what it is. It supplements your diet. But a lot of people are using it as a replacement because they're not getting in their regular diet. So really kind of looking at your overall nutrition and what those micronutrients are you getting. And then you start supplementing the ones that you're deficient in or that you need a little bit more in. Most people boost on vitamin C when they feel sick. Why not do it all the time Right. <laughs> just to live that healthy life instead of waiting until your car breaks down to get it fixed kind of thing. Exactly. Um, so all of these, like Pat is saying, it's, they're micro on the importance, but they really carry out a lot of the processes in our body and make sure that they happen. So think of uh, some of these micronutrients are kind of like a catalyst to like a 20 event thing happening in our body. And that catalyst is mighty important because without that, the rest of the process doesn't happen. I always tell patients, uh, if we look at a vehicle or a car, you know, it's sexy to look at the body of it or maybe the tires or like all the things you can see and touch or even the engine. But like a micronutrient would be oil. Like, yep, everything can be fine. Oil is a really easy change when it's low. Yep, just add some. But if you ignore that and then we'd never take care of it, that whole engine is worthless. You can completely total your vehicle. So the micronutrients kind of work that way. They have very specific roles, but they're meant to exist in our body in a certain ratio to keep things going. Like Pat was saying, the vitamin C. Vitamin C is important, but we can see how someone like goes through life or experiences life. Vitamin D is a good example too. On the lower end, like having enough versus optimizing and being at that right level. And those micronutrients really are that underlying thing that makes a huge, huge change for patients. Yeah, like vitamin D, I mean, not to get too scientific or the numbers, but basically 30 to 70 is the normal range or 30 to 90. That's a huge range. So if you're at 31, you're considered normal, but you're just one point from considering you have like a disease or a deficiency. Right. But we want to be up towards that um, upper level because that's where you're functioning the right. You're not running at your lowest fuel source and praying that you're just going to get to your next uh, destination. Right. So when we say like those levels, that's kind of the difference of if we had to go out and run the mile, like surviving it and just maybe like, oh, that was a win because I didn't have to stop and walk versus like approaching like a personal record and really fueling your body for optimum human performance. Yeah. You're barely, Huge range. Sc- barely scooting by or doing it at your best ability. I'm, I like to lean more towards the best ability. I'm yeah. pretty, I'm pretty happy in that level. hundred percent. So let's uh, kind of bring some of this together. Um, my couple big bullet points I would say is we want to fuel ourselves for what we're doing. Um, I always coach clients that are going through our restart program to look ahead at their week and then day by day for their nutrition so that you're aware of, Oh man, that's going to be a late night. I have that meeting. And then, Ooh, my morning is actually really early the next day. So how can I pre-plan for that? How can I make sure I have the food so that we're not putting ourselves in that scenario of, Hey, I totally understand what you're saying, Sam and Pat, but my house is really busy in the morning and I don't know what to do different than just grabbing those foods or going to Starbucks or, 
you know, grabbing the stuff that's at the office already. Yeah. If you drive down the highway, it's, you know, the fast pass to wherever you're going. You don't see any healthy restaurants or <laughs> health stores along that highway. It's nothing but fast food, your Wendy's, your in and outs and all that. Right. Because it's right there. And that's marketing. That's a genius. <laughs> and the more we can kind of plan ahead, you know, it stops you from that bad decision first thing in the morning, but also at night. You've had a long day. You're like, oh, I'm just going to pick something up. That'll be easier. So when we can plan ahead a bit, you have to, because when it comes to nutrition, your home cooked meals are always going to be our best when we're using our um, like organic sources. We're getting all of these good meats. And then you're not playing this guessing game of thinking you're eating healthy, but you don't know that that restaurant uses a certain sauce or all the sugar that's hidden in all these things. So it's actually making sure that you're getting what you want. So yeah, you're in control of your life, your nutrition, and then your future. Right. We pre-plan that nutrition just like we would pre-plan the stimulus. You know if you're going to get to the gym or not, or if you have to do a different workout that day because of your schedule. So plan ahead, know what's on your schedule so you can plan the nutrition around it. Don't be afraid. All three of the macronutrients we need, protein, carbs, fat. If you're going to be doing slower activities, not moving so much, use fat. If we're going to be using our body, use those good carbs. And this doesn't mean like I'm, I'm air quoting, <laughs> just like eat anything that's a carb because you're going to be active that day. But we want to still use those quality sources. Um, what would you say, Pat? What are the takeaways you want people to have? I mean, you just mentioned a big one was actually planning it out, like having a schedule in mind. So you're not just doing it by the, I guess, what is it? Flying by the seat of your pants yep. is a big takeaway. And then just being aware of what's going on and having a little bit of strategy behind it and properly fueling your body for its purpose and not just blindly going about it and hoping for the best. Yeah. So plan, make sure you know uh, what's on your plate, air quoting, um, for the week so you can determine what should be on your plate. How does that work in with your exercise? How does it work in with your sleep? And Make sure that this is actually aligning and going towards your goals. If you're just kind of drifting through life, but you don't have a set goal of what our body should look like, I promise you it's only going to be on a downhill. So make that plan and make it monthly. Make it yearly. It doesn't have to be this New Year's resolution of I need to lose X amount of weight. But everybody has an ideal vision in their mind of what their body should look like. But talk with one of us, develop a strategy so that day by day, you're actually working towards that. It doesn't just become that thing that is the pull you down during the day. Cause you look in the mirror and you're like, damn it. I hate that one part of my body or I really hate X, Y, Z. Talk to us, make a proactive plan. So we can start to align this and uh, get you happier and healthier. And final takeaway, carbs and fats are not evil. <laughs> okay. It's how you utilize them and you yes. could make it, the bad or you can make it the great and that's the biggest takeaway i think there's good and bad and everything make sure you're getting it from good sources make sure you are um fueling yourself the right the right way like pat said it's all about how you use it so thank you everybody for listening can't wait to have you join us next time we'll continue to talk about nutrition and get you educated so you can take troll take charge and live a happy healthy awesome life amazing fix medical group we'll see you later